morning and welcome to the 11th meeting of the Health and Sports Committee for 2018. I'd like to welcome our witnesses uh, to the committee. Can I ask everyone uh, in the room please to switch mobile phones off or to silent? Uh, and while uh, use of mobile devices for social media is uh, welcome, I uh, would also ask you not to photograph or record proceedings as we do that uh, through our committee staff. Thank you very much. Our first item is our evidence session on neurological conditions, which is part of our inquiry into the preventive agenda. And uh, uh, it's a pleasure to welcome to the committee today Pamela McKenzie, the Director of Neurological Services uh, and Scotland with Sue Ryder Foundation, Tamith Muller, uh, Vice Chair of the Neurological Alliance of Scotland, Professor Malcolm McLeod, Professor of Neurology and Translational Neuroscience at the University of Edinburgh and Clinical Lead for Neurology at NHS Forth Valley, Dr John Paul Leach, Consultant Neurologist representing the Association of British Neurologists and a Council Member, and Mario O'Keefe, the Chief Executive Officer of Lukey House. Uh, welcome. I, I know you will uh, all uh, want to take part fully in the session. We have uh, time for uh, a range of questions and uh, members will uh, have a range of questions for you. Uh, and uh, uh, answer questions and answers through the chair. But of course, if you feel uh, you would like to chip in on an, uh, to uh, provide additional answer to one that uh, one of your colleagues has already addressed, then please feel free to do so. I think um, wh where I would like to start is with the uh, aim to produce a national action plan and also revise standards for the neurological health services in the course of this year. And uh, perhaps the place to start our evidence session is with a question about the activities which are being undertaken towards the Na National Action Plan to ask whether these are the right activities uh, uh, aiming towards that in the development of a na National Action Plan. Who would like to kick off on that subject? Um, there's nobody that would not say that it is right to have a National Action mm -hmm. Plan. However, um, we have fairly recently in 2009, I think it was, we went through standards before and what was very disappointing for us was the lack of take up of those standards before. So we would welcome very much having national standards. However, there has to be a commitment that they will be taken forward. Surely. And Pamela. Yes, I'd just like to say, um, you know, I would um, echo what Mary has just said in terms of, you know, reference to the 2009 clinical standards. Whilst this was a very good document, um, it wasn't mandatory. And my understanding is the new standards are not mandatory either. So what we do need to follow that piece of work is some um, good inspection regime, um, which will be able to um, scrutinise shortfalls um, in services and make sure there's clear action planning so that we don't end up with something that doesn't have priority um, as has happened with the 2009 standards. Um, in relation to um, the action plan itself, I mean, this is fantastic news for us. It's what we've all been asking for. Um, and I think, you know, the pieces of work that are going on around that um, will, really, um, will really help. We hope that the National Advisory Committee for Neurological Conditions will be given the authority and also um, the resources to support um, the implementation of that action plan. Thank you very much. Uh, so so I, th I think there are probably two or three issues here. I was involved in trying to uh, oversee the implementation of the previous audit standards. And one of the difficulties is that there were quite so many of them. It operationalised out to about 108 or 109 different audit standards. And it's, uh, if you ask people to do everything, they'll, they'll not be able to focus on doing anything to any great extent. So I think the first thing is to have a core set of things which are priorities that we seek to get people to look for. The second thing is to make a distinction between audit for accountability and audit for improvement. And I would hope that this is an exercise in audit for improvement. Uh, and the third thing is this, this difficulty that we have that services for people with neurological conditions are immersed and interspersed in every part of what the health service does, from primary care through to secondary care. And if you come to neurology services asking us to look at this, we touch perhaps 5 or 10% of that activity. And our patients use services in primary care and, and elsewhere that are used by other patients who've got disabilities that aren't neurological but are cardiac or oncological or whatever, and it may be sensible to try and separate those out because there's a kind of apartheid going on if we're interested in our neurology patients but less interested in cardiology or oncology patients. 
I, I, see, I th first thing I want to say is we do not want to go around reinventing the wheel here. We've got a national advisory committee for neurological conditions. Unfortunately, there's no representation here today, but I've sat on some of those committee meetings. We should, and I absolutely echo this call, we should empower and we should invigorate this committee and allow it to take the agenda further forward in all respects. We have to recognise the range of neurological conditions. It's not just people with severe disability requiring residential care. There's a massive percentage of our acute admissions to hospital have neurological conditions. Neurological conditions range from uh, intermittent, what we call paroxysmal disorders, through to progressive degenerative disorders. In many ways, neurological services in the last 15, 20 years in Scotland have blossomed. We've become victims in some ways of our own success. We're managing to deal with epilepsy, first seizures, MS, Parkinson's disease in specialist clinics in a way that we could not even dream of in the 1990s. Uh, but now, of course, for instance, if you look at it one way, all people with uh, first seizures will now be seen at some point by a neurologist. Now, that might feel like poverty when they have to wait three months, but as opposed to 20 years ago when first seizure patients were seeing accident emergency doctors, psychiatrists, general physicians, we're in a, a, a better place. Yes, there's room for improvement. Actually, the best a group to tell us how much further improvement we need will be the National Advisory Committee for Neurological Conditions. And reinvigorating and empowering them is going to be absolutely key to where we go in the next 10, 20 years for neurological conditions in Scotland. Thank you very much. Um, Emma Harper and then Sandra White. Okay, thank you, Good morning, everybody. I'm interested in the development of new standards that are up, up uh, I guess, supporting the development of standards that are up to date compared to the 2009 ones. And I know there's a general standards for neurological care and support scoping report, which was published in March this year by Health Improvement Scotland. And it's listing standards that have been developed for many neurological conditions. But you've just described, Professor Malcolm McLeod, that a lot of the core processes around neurological care are the same. Um, so rather than reinventing the wheel, what would you say as far as developing the core standards that then could be separated different when we have to look at different neurological conditions like Parkinson's and epilepsy, which might have different needs than MND when you're doing non-invasive ventilation at night, for instance, at home? So some of the some of the needs, and, and I think we're talking largely about uh, specialist nursing support, for instance. Some of the some of the needs are genetic and apply to all patients, <coughs> and some are very specific to the disease in question. Although, for instance, with motor neuron disease and non-invasive ventilation, that might also apply to patients with myasthenia gravis and other neuromuscular conditions. I've been concerned for a number of years about what I call diagnostic apartheid which is that if you come to my neurology service in Forth Valley and you've got one of five conditions, you've got access to a specialist nurse. And until very recently, if you didn't have a condition that was on that list, you had nothing. And so the growth in generic neurology specialist nurses, and we've got two in post in Forth Valley just now, is, is I think, very important. In terms of audit standards, there's, there's process and outcome audit. And outcome audit is quite difficult because the outcomes that we don't want to see are thankfully quite rare. And so if you measure a service against valproid exposed pregnancies, for instance, those hopefully are going to be very rare events and perhaps not give you enough information to feed back for the improvement. Process audits are, are, are difficult. And actually, the experience both from the cancer tracking audits and for the Scottish Stroke Care Audit is that they require a bit of admin to work. So when I see a patient in the TIA clinic in Larbert, I fill in a form which then goes to an audit data controller who then puts it in and then it gets fed to ISD and then that information comes back on a monthly basis to tell us how well we're doing. And if you want to do a similar thing for neurology, you're going to need audit workers in every neurology centre to capture that information. I could jump Paul's point though that, that the patients that we see in our clinics are actually a very small proportion of the patients who've got neurological conditions and a focus just on neurology services to the exclusion of primary care is, I think, not going to meet where the bulk of the problems with neurological, sorry, services for neurological patients is. Pamela. I mean, I think in terms of the new um, standards that are being applied, they're quite different from the clinical standards in 2009. I think there are some similarities. 
um, as it's been said there. But however, this is encompassing the whole person. This isn't just about sort of acute hospital um, approach to things. This is about a pathway approach to people with a variety of neurological conditions and about living their life to the fullest and getting the best outcomes from a health perspective, from a well-being perspective, from a family perspective. So that's what we would hope to see as being driven through these standards is that we're not just lo we're looking at that whole person um, as opposed to just um, purely clinical outcomes. Mary. I uh, re-echo some of the aspects about the commonality of a lot of the nursing care, the needs of people with neurological conditions. At Lukey, we look after um, 35 different conditions and we also provide just under 6,500 6, respite days and we look after people from 26 local authorities. So I think we're able to talk quite effectively, I think, about, you know, throughout Scotland. Um, we have been... Uh, we developed our service specifically, not just about respite, but what we call the Lukey MOT, which I think you probably read about. But it means that we can fully assess our physical, our guests' physical and emotional requirements when they're with us. So every guest gets a wheelchair assessment. Every guest gets weighed, which is really difficult um, in the community. Everybody gets a wheelchair alignment because with the degeneration it is really you know can change everybody gets pressure mapped everybody gets a full body map everybody gets an oral assessment we're working with volunteer pharmacists to do spot polypharmacy we're um, we're a nurse-led and physio-led service that we are able to impact not just on the guests but their carers as well because carers can come and stay if they so wish with their with their partner and we can work with them as a couple or individually on both their physical and emotional requirements. Now, last year we did over 800 anticipatory or preventative interventions. And I think, you know, using third sector a lot more could be very beneficial. Um, I think on the specialist nurses point, this is quite a complex area and there's a range of nursing interventions at different stages of different conditions and actually quite a lot of variety in the role that specialist nurses um, in different conditions perform. So an epilepsy specialist nurse will be offering a very different package of support to an MND nurse specialist. And it's, it's quite important to look at the whole of the journey, not just the um, in-depth um, advanced neurological care um, that's provided, but also the stuff up front where in the condition I work in in my day job, for example, a Parkinson's nurse specialist at diagnosis advising people about um, the risk of impulse control disorders from the medication they're taking and dealing with the mop-up of that is actually a really important part of, part of the support that they provide, which isn't relevant to other conditions, but is, is, is distinct. So the specialist nurses point is 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 really quite broad and i think one of the opportunities in the um, action plan work is to really deal as we said with the breadth of experience that there is um, and try and make sure that we have pathways and general rules that apply where they're general but also recognize that there's significant differences in the needs of different people in the community just as a final quick sup um in 2009, when the standards were written, we didn't have health and social care integration, and I know other members will probably uh, talk more detailed about that. So obviously the community care, the best place to have your care in your home for your health, well-being, and your family will be part of new standards being developed. I, I mean, feel free to comment on that. Um, I, we all welcome integration. I mean, there's absolutely nobody in this room that would not want integration, however, we would say that it is quite young, embryonic, and um, just now there's a lot of people that are falling down in the cracks of that. I'm not saying that in 10 years' time it will not be absolutely fantastic, but until we manage to get out of the silos and the separate thinking and get much more of the joined-up thinking, a lot of people are falling down in the silos of that just now. And just in terms of the health and social care partners, you know, they are um, embryonic at the moment, um, but I think as well in terms of getting it right, uh, we have to see um, strategic commissioning guidance um, to the health and social care partnerships. They're really quite inexperienced in the delivery of that pathway approach for neurological conditions. Um, so I would welcome some commissioning um, guidance to the partnerships so that we get away from generic um, tendering, generic commissioning, which doesn't offer um, the clients with complex neurological conditions the right service at the right time. There. Sandra. A small follow-up. I'm so pleased that you mentioned epilepsy. 
because I'd been given a pie chart and epilepsy isn't mentioned in it at all under neurological diseases. And when we're talking about the standards, obviously 2009 one, uh, it does mention epilepsy, but only the specific indicators for epilepsy. Could you perhaps expand on that a bit? You would expect the new standards to be looking more at the situation of epilepsy. And I may come on later on to the specialist nurses, but uh, I just wondered what your thoughts on that. Because it doesn't mention the fact that, um, you know, conditions, it just says, give specific in the 2009 plan to epilepsy and even doesn't mention it in the pie chart. So I just wonder if it's got to be specifically... You know, Certainly, in, in, in the older uh, uh, standards, there was some mention of rapidity of access to care for mm -hmm. epilepsy and, and for seizure. We know that the epilepsy subgroup in the National Advisory Committee for Neurological Conditions is one of the more active ones and has been uh, very proactive in setting out their mm -hmm. ambitions for how uh, epilepsy care should, should shape up across all areas in Scotland. Uh, so, yes, it's very much at the heart of what the NACNC will be doing um, and the epilepsy representative, the epilepsy subgroup representative, is, is very prominent in that committee. So, yes, I, I'm surprised that there's no mention of it. As you know, mm -hmm. epilepsy is one of the most common neurological mm -hmm. disorders it's at the other end of the spectrum, if you like, from the other, the, from the one end that many of our, 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 our witnesses today will talk about the residential care, severe, progressive, degenerative conditions. Mm -hmm. Epilepsy is one where, actually, with with good medical mm -hmm. care and intervention, most people will be able to lead a full life and, and be seizure free. Uh, but they need the good care, uh, both from doctors and nurses, to, to allow for that. Mm -hmm. Just to add, um, on the um, Standards Development Group, um, Epilepsy Scotland is represented on that group. Um, and as I understand it, at the moment, the condition-specific standards for epilepsy are deemed to be continuing while the generic standards are, are resolved. But I've got no doubt that colleagues in Epilepsy Scotland will be making the case for the best possible support. The other thing I'm aware of is that there was a fairly recently published sign guideline on the management of epilepsy. And I know that that's formed a great part of the work of the epilepsy um, group, which um, Dr. Dr. Leach referred to. Thank you very much. The, the issue that with the existing standards, as has been said, is the, the lack of application, the lack of implementation in, in many cases. So, so who will be responsible for monitoring both the effectiveness of the plan and the implementation of the standards? What will happen if standards are not provided up to uh, uh, scratch? And does the National Advisory Committee, which has been mentioned, have the authority uh, to, to uh, play an active part in that. Clearly we've heard it's important, but we've also heard it needs to be reinvigorated and re-empowered. Um, that, that obviously must give some cause for concern. I wonder what witnesses would uh, say to those key issues. Well, it it's safe to say that within the third sector community there are some ongoing concerns about how new standards will be implemented and how they'll be monitored. Um, we are aware that NHS Health Improvement Scotland is stepping back from doing that scrutiny role and it is leaving a, a gap in terms of who will provide that scrutiny. Um, lessons from history tell us that the um, the neurological standards really did lose energy at the point at which um, NHS Health Improvement Scotland loosened the reins the last time and after the investment in boards getting the 1.2 million to do local improvement work, um, which is referenced, um, it became much more difficult to, to hold them to account, although the former National Advisory Group did attempt to do that. It wasn't really resourced to do it properly. So, um, as Pamela said, I think there is a case for more resourcing for the National Advisory Committee if it is going to be the body that takes on that role. And I'll be interested to see how that work emerges. The recent the recent work that was carried out by Sue Ryder and the fact, you know, the book the plans within each of the IGBs, 31 IGBs, that was quite worrying in the fact that there was, you know, no plans in some areas and, you know, for all of a sudden then if there's no teeth behind it, you know, when you've got really, you know, difficult decisions to make as far as budgets are concerned, there is an element of, well, we don't have to adhere to that, so let's just see if we've got it. And, you know, it's a shame to say that, but that is the case. Pamela. 
I mean, I think, um, as I said earlier, I think it is about the resource to be able to implement these standards and to scrutinise them. I think that's essential. Now, where that lies, um, that resource lies, if it's with Health Improvement Scotland or with the, the National Advisory Group, that's another that's another question altogether. But um, scrutinised it must be, or else, you know, as Mary said, our report quite clearly stated that every health authority was supposed to have a national action plan for neurology. And in fact, in 2017, only four of them had one that wasn't active and was due to expire. So it's absolutely critical that we get this right in order to not um, revert to what we currently have. Uh, Malcolm, then yeah, so, so, so my experience of, of, of this, and we got some money in Forth Valley around this, but, but short-term non-recurrent bits of money aren't actually very much good for anything because you can't make long-term investments with it. And the other problem when you measure services and you're, and, and you're auditing for accountability, which is what it sounds like we're talking here, a minimum set of standards which must be achieved, if the board doesn't have the resource to recruit or provide the service, then you end up setting people locally up to fail because all they're going to do is report that they can't actually achieve what they've been asked to achieve and nobody wants to be involved in that kind of activity if there's nothing that can be done to sort it. And, you know, the elephant in the room is that the reason why people are concerned is because neurological services in Scotland are not optimal. And the reason they're not optimal isn't because we don't audit them enough, it's because we don't resource them well enough. And unless we... You know, and, and if this attempt to look at an, at an audit system and a standard system is like some kind of uh, sop to say, oh, well, we're doing something because something must be done, then it's a waste of everybody's time. And actually investing in the primary services that we're trying to audit is where the resource should be going and where the activity should be going. John Paul. Uh, just, just to echo some of what's been said earlier on, we, we have to make absolutely sure that the... I, mean, I don't like to speak for the NACNC, but we have to make absolutely sure that they're resourced enough and empowered enough, that they can speak truth to power, that they can say when things are not going well, and th that requires the resource so that they can work out what's not going well, and secondly, the mechanism by which they can report upwards. If I can say one other thing, the, one of the recurrent uh, themes around uh, the advisory group in its current form and in its previous form, the national advisory group, was that really we weren't encouraged to talk about workforce. Workforce was something, the W word should not be mentioned, because if you start talking about workforce, you might have to talk about recurrent money to spend on more staff at the front line and in, in, in chronic care for neurological conditions. And really, you, you, you cannot have a committee like NACNC, which is uh, bidden to keep away from sensitive issues, politically sensitive. And, and if, you, if you want the truth, then you're going to have to be prepared for some uncomfortable news about workforce. Is it about priorities at board level or at government level? You mean priorities for, for funding? Well, well, boards are underfunded and most of them are running a deficit and most of them are scrabbling very hard uh, to save what money they can, not to fill posts if they can avoid filling posts to salary gap and all that stuff because they're skint. And if you had chief execs in here, they would tell you that they're largely skint. We, we, we do and we, we hear it. Yes. <laughs> I mean, resource. I mean, we can't get away from the fact that you know there is budgetary pressures. But I think, in terms of kind of planning for neurology going forward, we do need to think about where resources are currently allocated, and they're not necessarily allocated in the right way. They could be, if we're talking about a pathway approach. We've already talked about low-level services and um, for people to support them in the community a lot longer, and um, be that kind of with benefits or be it with um, managing their own conditions through a specialist nurse or specialist advisors and um, we don't invest in that level which means they go into we only hear from them when they go into crisis which means they go into the acute sector um, with which is an expensive hospital stay um, and that can it can be avoided with the right preventative services and that's the so the pathway approach to neurological care in its um, in its entirety isn't resourced in the right way. So I think we need a radical reshape of the current services in order to free up resources to be able to deliver things in a very different way, which brings care closer to home, um, which is what we all want, um, and avoids costly hospital interventions, which are not great for the economy and certainly not great in terms of outcomes for that individual or their families. Okay. Uh, Marie and then Malcolm. Pamela's just said because a lot of the work that we do at Lukey doesn't actually take a lot of time when you're with the guest and you don't you know it doesn't take a lot of resource when you're actually with the guest but one of the, the major things is pressure mapping showing one of our guests that when they sit in their wheelchair we put a little 
tiny little mat thing underneath them that's linked to um, a computer. We can see the red areas that are likely to break down. We work with the guests using core exercises and physiotherapy on how to avoid that. Now, the amount of money that that saves the NHS if that skin does not break down is huge. Now, it you, again, it's difficult to quantify, but again, we're working with, with people that are high resource individuals and also their carers, that we can work together with them to make sure that we're doing things that are going to make their quality of life better. So coming to Lukey is not just about a fun holiday respite aspect. The actual real miracle of Lukey is what we equip our guests to go home with, and that is a quality of life it's a statement. So, so, so one of the frustrations in the past has been that while in our, in our glorious Scottish Health Service the money doesn't follow the patient, that means that the savings also don't follow the patient. So over the last 10 years, we've reduced the bed days that we use in Lothian by about 75%, which is a substantial <laughs> saving. But the, lo, those funds have just disappeared. They've not reverted to the neurology service to allow local reinvestment to support the activity. And, and, that, and, that, and that's, I think, a difficulty. If we, if we get beyond the we'd like more money, please, to how can we be more efficient, more effective, prioritise better with the money, the funds we've got, which I, you know, is, 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 is where we are, uh, then I think the issue is that we, we have to decide what our priorities are because we can't have everything being a priority and we've got to think about key areas for improvement rather than saying this is the minimum standard which everyone should aspire to and everyone really knows that it's hopelessly optimistic and we're just setting ourselves up to fail, which is, which is my, my emphasis on having a small number of areas where we think it wouldn't take very much resource to make really quite a major difference in the experience of people with these conditions and trying to get some kind of local or national consensus about what they should be and a way of measuring it. And I think that's the way that we can get most out of this process. Thank you very much. <coughs> Jenny Gurruth. Good morning to the panel. Um, Palma McKenzie, I'd just like to pick up on some of the points you raise uh, in your written submission with regard to health and social care partnerships. Um, you mentioned, obviously, that the partnerships are under no compulsion to specifically include neurological services within their remit, unlike other service areas such as palliative care, uh, and there is little or no mention of care and support for people with neurological conditions in any HSPC strategic plan. Um, why do you think, then, that the partnerships don't recognise it's part of their responsibility to deliver neurological services? Is it just because it's not compulsory, or is there a, what's going on there? Um, I mean, I think there's a couple of things, really. I think we um, each authority area in terms of population the numbers will not be um, as big as it's seen as a priority area so older people will always take precedence because there's a growing number of older people and they need to get shift the balance of you know, where the care is being provided there so I think there's something in terms of the number but there's also that it just is not a requirement so they get lumped into other categories so you will normally see neurological conditions in under physical disability for instance so if you looked at joint commissioning plans for the um, HSP, you know, integration bodies at the moment you will see some loose um, mention of neurology in under physical disability but not in its own right and I think um, as I said earlier, I think you know where we need we need to get commissioning for neurological services um, right. So there needs to be guidance and expertise. And I don't think it's a conscious um, it, you know ignoring of the fact, but I think it's just it's fallen off the political radar. It's fallen off everybody's radar, and it's only in the last eighteen months that things have started to be highlighted in terms of the real inadequacies that people with neurological conditions um, are actually living with on a day to day basis. Mm -hmm. right. I'd just like to add to that, um, the neurological conditions that we are talking about are all palliative. They're not going to get better. You know, and it, it's, unfortunately, it's just beginning to be recognised within the palliative care strategy that, you know, that neurological conditions are a palliative situation. We don't get parity in funding, but we are, we're not end of life. Well, we're not end of life, but, you know, I'm sure, you know we, unfortunately, it does happen. But, um, but all our conditions are palliative. They're not going to get better. Mm -hmm. um. I, I just want to switch back to um, to the question about why it is that neurology isn't included. Um, way back when the legislation was going through, the Scottish Government did an exercise about um, 
where which services would be compulsorily part of integration and neurology wasn't one of those and I think that that's part of where the split arises it's seen as an acute specialty without recognizing the huge um, amount of work that health and social care partnerships are actually doing supporting people living day to day um, with mm -hmm. neurological conditions they don't separate it out that way because neurology is seen as an acute specialist special specialty one way around that is to actually give them delegated authority in which to be able to um, develop plans for, for commissioning neurological services. Sure. Supplementary then, um, Pamela McKenzie, in your evidence, you highlight that disconnect um, at local level and the kind of disparity across the country in terms of how services are provided. So in 2017, you'd ask health boards and local authorities if they had a specialist neurological rehabilitation team. Uh, only a third of health boards had such a team out of uh, 32 local authorities that we have, and only five uh, had such a team, I think, which was specifically with regard to specialist occupational therapy. Um, and many local authorities and health boards believed a service or partial service was available locally, but did not necessarily provide it themselves. This paints a picture of a complex and piecemeal system. What's been the impact then on service users with regard to how that piecemeal system is delivered on the ground? Well, I think it is kind of a postcode lottery um, in terms of, you know, you mentioned, you know, where there, is, there are shortfalls in terms of community rehabilitation teams. Um, so if you happen to be able to live where there is one, then you may have access to it, but only if you've been pointed in that direction. A lot of the GPs, etc., will not know that even exists. Um, in that piece of data, actually, there was real confusion over um, actually local authorities thinking that health did it and health thinking local authorities did it, it in that same geographical area. So there was a real um, disconnect there in terms of that piece but we do know that if you have good um, rehabilitation services um, in both preventative um, and acquired in neurological conditions um, it can have a huge impact on people's well-being and whilst you know progressive neurological conditions won't necessarily be prevented actually the health complications that can ensue through rehabilitation can be can, can I ask what the neurologist view is of what IGB should be doing in this space? Yeah, again, I, I want to stress the, the spectrum of conditions we talk about here, and there's always a danger of unintended consequences if we divert uh, neuro, all neurology services or the majority of neurology services towards the chronic degenerative condition. We will ignore much of the acute work that needs to be done. Um, we cannot take people away from the front line dealing with these acute presentations of neurological problems to do other things and expect no adverse events otherwise. So it's again just to stress, yeah, I'm absolutely sure that the work that Sue Ryder and, and Mary's care home do absolutely vital and, and will be state of the art, but there are other aspects of neurology care as well. I was, I'll be honest, slightly concerned when the Sue Ryder report came out saying that in Scotland we were failing neurological patients. Well, we were failing some patients with one end of a spectrum of neurological disorder. We have to look at the big spectrum. And, and the big problem here, a, a very poor unintended consequence, could be a derogation of acute neurology care if we focus too much on the long-term conditions. Yes, we need to look at all of these things. I'm not saying anyone should be ignored or we should ignore these pressing matters of, of long-term care issues, but we can't forget what neurology means in its totality. Welcome, and then to Ath and then Pamela. Yes, yeah, yeah. so, so I, th I think there's a, there's a slight danger of this one-size-fits-all thing that you need to have a specialist occupational therapist for every patient in, in the community. So imagine that you're dealing with outreach from the Astley Ainsley Hospital here with people with acquired brain injury, then clearly you need that high-level specialist. But then if you're repatriated to, I don't know, Ackleti Bui or somewhere where you live, then, then it might be more reasonable to have someone who's got more genetic skills who can cover the, uh, you know, a range of different patients in that population area. To say that, to say that every board and every service should have a kind of full set of, of things that we want, I, I don't think necessarily is the most cost-effective way to provide it. And I think there should be a, 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 an allowance for flexibility in local implementation according to local needs and also local patterns of disease, which, which vary in different parts of Scotland. Yeah, um, I just wanted to say, uh, if I wanted to know what was happening in neurological services, I'm not sure that either health boards or local authorities would necessarily know 
what's on the ground and I think that's one of the big issues so my suspicion is that the data looks very bad but actually if you have survived a stroke then there will be some specialist support for you locally in most parts of Scotland there will be some specialist support for people with MS people with Parkinson's that's actually provided in the community which isn't reflected in the answers that Sue Ryder got from their report and I think one of the real challenges is this is a really complex picture. It's really complicated, difficult to measure and difficult to audit. So what we need to do is get to a point where we've agreed what we think there is and you know, we can use all the intelligence that we can get from different agencies to really map what's where and where it's going and that's one of the really good things that I think that the National Advisory Committee is looking at because it's only when we really know that that we can move forward and work out what needs to change. I think just to give some reassurance in terms of what our report in 2016 and 17 set out to achieve and it wasn't to discredit the acute services in any way shape or form um, and indeed you know I know there is some great work going on there and you know we actually you know acknowledge that um, we aren't just about this the high end um, care for people we do very low level service in terms of self-management at Sue Ryder as well as um, care at home um, so we you know, we do cover a wide gambit of um, care provision, offering choice for the individual. Um, to um, take up Malcolm's point as well about kind of, you know, if it's that specialism in our report, in one of the conclusions, we are actually talking about educating more generalist providers so that they can indeed be able to provide a quality service. So we don't have to have a specialist nurse in Ackleton Bewey, but we c you may be able to educate and support the providers who are currently delivering care at home or community services in Ackleton Bewey to be able to deliver a better service so that people can stay at home longer, their conditions manage better, um, and they have less um, health impacts. Thank you very much. Um, Brian Whitlock. Good morning to the panel. I think just touched on that, the, the potential lack of data to inform this, the development of a, an action plan. And I, not, I noted in some of the submissions that uh, prevalence data is lacking in service provision data. It's hard to identi identify and or missing uh, in relation to neurological conditions. And I know that uh, Professor McLeod, you were calling for the incorporation of the, the, the chi tagging of activity uh, in primary care and across social care activity. I think with that in mind, I wondered how this lack of specific data is hampering uh, the provision of services uh, for people with neurological conditions, especially since most of, of those uh, people will have a diagnosis that is known uh, to the health service and the social care services. And really, why, why is that lack of data and perhaps what data is required? So, so we don't have disease registries. So we see patients in our neurology clinic, they come to us, we write the GP a letter, the GP gets the letter, and we maybe need to see them again, and maybe we don't. But we don't feed that information into a central database of who's got what condition. And there's good reasons for that, not just that it would be burdensome to do, but privacy and, and all and all and all. Which means that when people ask us, you know, how many patients do you have with myasthenia in your patch, we don't actually know, unless we trawl through our last year's 10,000 letters to try and work out what, what those numbers are. Now, uh, it, it would be feasible, potentially, to have a registry of patients seen in neurology clinics with neurology diagnoses and what those diagnoses were, but actually that would then miss the large number of patients who have previously been seen in neurology clinics and discharged for, for care in the community. So patients with epilepsy might not have been seen in a clinic for many years for good reason because they don't need to be seen. And it would also miss that large part of the iceberg which floats underwater, which, sorry, which sits underwater, uh, of patients with neurological impairments who've never been seen at a neurology clinic because they're managed in primary care. So while I, while I think it's a nice idea that you would have a kind of list of where people were and what services they were using and what their needs were, I think it's a, it's a bit more complicated to actually to try and implement that. Having said that, the idea that where people impact on publicly provided services, whether they're in, in, in health or social care, that that activity is recorded through, through the Community Health Index, through the CHI number, then that at least allows us to see where patients are. So, for instance, uh, the, the, the issue of valproate in pregnancy, one of our epilepsy drugs is at risk in pregnancy. We do have CHI linkage for 
patients picking up a prescription of valproate from their community chemist, from their community pharmacy. And we do have data for chi linkage of people who interact with our obstetric services. So by matching those numbers, we can see the people with epilepsy. Who are, and, and the more we collect chi, the richer that source of data becomes for understanding where our patients are and what services they're accessing. accessing. I've been working with ISD. There's a lot of data as far as NHS is concerned, but the, the actual uh, figures that they're collect collating as far as social services and local authorities are concerned is still very young, but they are working on trying to get a bigger picture of what's happening in the community as well as what's happening um, within acute services. Um, the other aspect is I'm not quite sure what the uh, effect of Spire will have the the data service that's being used with GP surgeries. Um, we're hoping that that will certainly bring a lot more back, but um, it's still very young and it's just being, I think, rolled out in the west of Scotland just now. So I don't know what effect that would have on it. Okay. Right. Could yeah, I'm just interested in mean, the collection of data. Is, is there the potential there for the sort of the anonymity? I know you were. You, suggesting that with the anonymity of the patient uh, and so the data it's, there's not a lot attaching somebody to the data in, th in that respect I also wondered if, if, if uh, as you alluded to how will the tagging of the activity across primary and social care through someone's kind number benefit the development of the services uh, so for instance one of the things that we might want to see is if patients are seen in a neurology clinic and we discharge them because the headache we think we've sorted it would be interesting to know if they were seeing their GP once in a blue moon after that or once a week. And if you had a chi tagging for each GP visit, you would get a sense of how much we... Because, because if neurology services are in difficulty just now, primary care is, is in, in great, great difficulty in this country. Uh, there are many practices which are really struggling. Uh, and to the extent that we in secondary care can help alleviate some of that burden on primary care. It's really important. So if we're seeing people and just chucking them back to the GPs and they're creating burden in primary care for the GPs or practice nurses, that's not a good thing. But we don't know that just now because we don't know what the amount of activity is there. But these are very low-level process activity measures. Uh, getting outcome measures on quality of, of, of life, which is the main thing, or premature death or A&E attendances or whatever, you can, you can do little bits of that, um, but it's very difficult to get, to get agreed measures. And it's quite burdensome to collect, but burdensome for the patient, I, I mean, not for the service, to collect that information for people on a recurrent basis, unless they can be convinced and we can be confident that we're actually going to be able to do something useful with the information. And one of the problems with the data and audit group last time round was that we were collecting all this information, but at the end of the day, there was the workforce issue that John Paul's alluded to, that there was no prospect of actually getting very much more in the way of, of, of services or neurologists or whatever. So, so what was actually going to change for these patients by us simply demonstrating that there was a problem? And I, th I think across neurology services, there was a lack of confidence that this was going to be anything very much more than an elaborate window dressing exercise, I'm afraid, which I think is one of the reasons why the energy fell away. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Miles Briggs. Um, thank you, convener, um, and good morning to the panel. Um, I wanted to um, touch upon community-based services and community care, and specifically um, the submission by Sue Ryder, which identified 86% of people um, with neurological conditions were in residential care homes for the elderly, and I think that equated to about 250 younger adults. So I wondered, what did the panel think could be done to try to address this and the issue of inappropriate care places in Scotland? I think, I mean, that was the, the, we don't know if that data is actually correct. We, we think it is actually much more than that. Um, what we will know um, in October is that the National Care Home Census have actually put neurological condition down now as part of the analysis of that data. So we probably have some more accurate information in terms of the number of younger people in older people's facilities. Um, I think... I think there's some things that we can do to support, um, because there isn't going to be specialist provision for everybody, but I think as I said earlier about the community services, there's ways in which we can support 
um, older people's care homes to be able to support people with complex neurological conditions. I'm not saying that the environment, environment might not be right, but um, there are ways in which we can support staff to be better educated around these complex conditions and manage them better. So I think that's something that we could do um, you know, quite quickly. Um, it will need to be resourced, um, but it is something I think we, we could manage quite, quite well. Um, I think that we could be using more kind of community provision going into um, nursing homes for people who have got these complex conditions, um, physios, occupational therapists, so that their needs are being met. Um, when we highlighted that as part of the report, we had many people come to us um, saying, you know, my relative is in an older people's care home. Um, I'm in despair because that was the only place that we could put them. Um, you know, they're, you know, early 50s. Um, on the back of that, we have had one such case that actually things have very much improved for them in terms of they're still in that care home, but they are now having some chest physio, some postural management, um, and actually their quality of life is significantly enhanced but the placement hasn't actually changed so I think there's things that, that can be done um, because we're not going to have specialist services everywhere it would be wonderful if we did um, and um, but and I think we should be aspirational enough to think that we have some more specialist um, residential provision across Scotland um, a more probably from a regionalized approach um, but um, I think that's, there's things that we could do there that could help improve the situation. Uh, Mary and then Tanith. Um, we do work with, uh, a lot of our guests are in residential care inappropriately. Um, and we work very closely with the residential areas because we do things like um, if we weighing our guests, we discover that they've lost weight and that or gained weight and that their pressure map their mattress is set at the wrong settings, but yet that's what's been used in the care home. We are also very able to uh, liaise with them about wheelchair replacements or wheelchair um, modifications. We're also very able to um, liaise with their their local, um, where they are, the residential at the time, with their diet and what they require for healing for pressure areas. You know, so we do a lot of work already with people that come to us for maybe four night break. However, they are residential somewhere else. But we've got some people with primary progressive MS who, you know, early thirties, and they're in a in a care home for the elderly, psychogeriatric, and it's very upsetting. We had one guest that um, came from Wick, and it was public. Uh, um, the local community funded for her to come down, and Logan Air provided the flights, and the difference to her quality of life was amazing in those two weeks, and actually what she took back also to the care home. Thanks, Tanith, and then Logan. Yeah, I mean, the issue of... Um, what happens to younger people with neurological conditions that need residential care is a complex one. We're aware of people who are younger who found it very difficult to find a place even in an older person's care home because older, older people's care homes won't take them. Um, and so that, that, creates, uh, that creates a real barrier. And in terms of solutions, I just wanted to flag up that a number of the national charities um, and local ones do provide training along the lines that Sue Ryder provides. So I know Huntington's Association and Parkinson's UK both run Cascade Learning for um, care home workers to help them to understand what they need to do to support them. And certainly the Parkinson's scheme works with home care workers as well to support people better at home. So... There are solutions out there, but it tends to be on a condition-specific basis rather than more generically because there aren't any generic charities to provide that. So, so this is a small group of patients, but, it, but it's complex. So there are very young uh, teenagers, adults with, uh, with neuromuscular problems like Duchenne dystrophy who've got complex physical needs. There are patients with multiple sclerosis that we've heard of. There's uh, uh, Huntington's, and that's got physical and emotional, psychological problems which need management. And perhaps the the greatest uh, well of untapped need is young head injury patients who've got physical and behavioural difficulties after the head injury for which there is very, very uh, patchy and limited provision. Now, one of, the, one of the tangible difficulties here is that if I open a facility for young, chronically sick patients with 10 beds in Forth Valley, it will be full in about six months. And because these young people will live for decades, it will remain full for 
decades and there will be no more space available. And so in providing these facilities, we need to think about how empty we want them to be because we always want them to be a little bit empty. And then how does that fit with the business model of whoever is providing it? Because they're going to be running at 70% capacity all the time just so that they can have space to take people when they need it. Uh, and it's one of the, you know, if, I, I don't know what John Paul's view is, but it's one of the tragedies of working as a clinician is seeing people in the wrong care setting, usually an acute hospital, because they're, they're, they're backed up down the line because there isn't an appropriate place where they can maximise their quality of life. Now, there's always, a, there's always a balance to be struck between them being near to their home and to their family and being in a centre of expertise and excellence. But just now, I'm afraid for most people, they're neither, and that's very disappointing. John Paul. Again, this is a, a reflection of the different perspectives we, we will have on neurological disorders for a very good reason. Um, and it does strike me that there's been an estimate of 200 patients, 250 patients across the country who are young but in a, an older care home. You, you think it's much more than that? You, you've got other data. Is, is this one of the parts of data that we really need to firm up on? Is this a problem that's affecting hundreds of patients or dozens of patients? I think we'd really need to know this. And if we're going to come out with some firm recommendations about where we go for catering with residential care we really need to have this scoped properly thank you so, Can I just as a you know in terms of permanent care places but in terms of respite I wanted to to also look at that aspect I was lucky enough to visit um Lucky House last year and just was blown away by the services you were providing and um, couldn't meet some of the guests because they were away out on a micro light flight and that is a sort of break which you know I think everyone want their loved ones to actually experience in a quality break and um, but in other parts of Scotland it's quite clear that a local old people's home does become the respite and many people don't want to put their loved ones in that setting do you have a picture across Scotland of what currently that is like and where there's real need for better investment in respite or or linking services into what we currently have i think um mary you mentioned 26 local authorities so my my question was really what are the others doing and what quality of respite do they then have i think to come back to it it's a postcode lottery and also we don't have enough data um to fully i would like to give a definitive answer to that however we do know that um the local authorities that we deal with, the, some of them will not send anybody to respite, you know, if they can, or else they'll only send them to respite to a care of the elderly environment because it will be cheaper than coming to Lukey. Now, Lukey is only 50, the guests are charged 50% of what the actual cost is, we fundraise the rest of it. However, because it is so person centred and we do so many anticipatory and preventative interventions, it is slightly more expensive than a care home. Um, but then if you look on, that's the short term looking at it, if you look on the long term with the preventative aspect, we're actually saving money for so many people and also giving quality of life. And we're also talking about emotional support, providing counselling, because so many people are quite angry about their condition. And the carers especially, they've not got the condition, but their life has changed unbelievably. So... It's looking at the whole picture, but it's very difficult to cost out. And I, I do take John Paul's point that, you know, we tend to look after the high end um, and the very high dependency. However, the, that's only two thirds. Another third of our guests are what we would term the lower end. So, you know, we, ha we are able to um, work across the sector in all aspects. But respite is incredibly patchy and the the local authorities and even SDS, SDS is a great thing in concept, but when you're dealing with cognition and fatigue and things, those things, it's difficult to make decisions about your SDS package if you if you can't uh, compute every, all the details that you need to have and stress carers are already so stressed to actually go through the SDS assessment, so it tends to end up the easiest way that they can do it, and that might not be the best aspect for them. Welcome. But I would just make the, make the observation that for patients who've got that high level of disability who require and benefit from, from respite care, there's this danger of apartheid because my understanding of the new uh, recommendations is that traumatic brain injury is not included on the list of neurological conditions. But, but the needs of those patients are almost identical to our patients with Huntington's or whatever. And there is a real danger that we're siloed in our approach to audit rather than saying this is about the services for people who, who would benefit from periods of respite irregardless of whether they've got, uh, whether they've got an underlying neurological condition or, or what their condition is. And I think it's important to, to bear that in mind. 
That's then Pamela. Um, one of the things that people report to um, us really across the complex conditions is that it can be very difficult to get a respite place at all because of the issues about the complexity of need that somebody has means that there's a limited number of places that will actually take that on. I'd really echo um, Malcolm's point about the... Um, about the scope of need that there is and the lack of suitable respite across all the all, all, all the all the conditions um, and the thing that we haven't really touched on very much is the extent of the impact that living with somebody with a neurological condition has on families and carers and the essential nature of providing respite to give people a break from people who typically at this more complex end have needs across all aspects of their life and pretty much constant supervision as well as the practical tasks of dressing and feeding and, and, and all of that kind of thing. And it really does have an immense impact on carers who worry very much about whether those needs will be met when somebody goes into respite. And certainly in my experience, I'm aware of people who will resist respite because of their concerns, despite the impact that that's having on their health and their ability to cope with their workload. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the panel have described the, the lack of respite um, very well, and I think that it is a postcode lottery. Um, what I would say as well is it, we've been exploring kind of... Um, I, hear what Tana said completely and agree with it. People will resist respite placements, even at the detriment of their own health, um, because they will not have their loved one go into somewhere that they deem as inappropriate. Interestingly, we've been working um, with Angus Health and Social Care Partnership on respite at home um, over the last couple of years, which has been quite an interesting project in terms of, you know, people are far more comfortable to have that respite at home, even to go and have, you know, go and have a round of golf and a couple of drinks with their mate rather than going in for two weeks respite into an older people's service. So I think we can start to, you know, there are solutions to, um, um, to traditional um, residential respite, um, not that that isn't necessary and isn't um, hugely beneficial, but there are other ways of, of looking at that and affording people choice at the end of the day. Not Harper. It's actually on that point, I was just going to say there are models of respite that are being um, developed, I know in Dumfries and Galloway, for instance, looking at respite being delivered in patients' homes or persons' homes. Um, but yes, there are challenges when there's really, really specialist needs required, especially for children with neurological conditions. So Acorn House in Dumfries, for instance. So you picked up on that point before I actually had a chance to ask you about it. Marty. You know, I totally agree that there is, you know, a lot of flexibility in how people would determine how they would like to spend their respite, and that's absolutely right. However, it does come to a point that it's just too stressful for so many people because if people are coming into their house, they've got to train them up, they've got to help them understand, they've got to, you know, and actually a lot of people find that more stressful than, you know, if they trust, a, 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 you know, somewhere. And that's what we say to our guests and their carers. It is a daunting experience sometimes to come into respite. I understand that. But we usually say, give us two sleeps and everything will be fine after that. Because they're, when they come to us, they're one of 20 people with a disability at home. They're only one person with a disability. When they come to us, we were looking after, you know, we've got check in, check out. It's, it's, we run it like a country house hotel ambience if we can. But we look after very complex conditions. But we have that relaxed atmosphere that makes it so much easier. And then it takes, you know... 24 hours for us to get to know you and you to get to know us but after that we're all fine because this is what we do this is what we're experienced in we're not going in as a team that maybe are not completely okay with the situation Python, specialist nursing. Thank, thank you very much President officer I have to correct something that I mentioned about epilepsy in the the pie chart it's in a very very small that red piece <laughs> but the so please correct that in the minutes if you don't mind the, the point I was trying to make in epilepsy was because head injury can cause brain injury, can cause epilepsy, and that's outside the pie chart because it's not recognised, as you said yourself, uh, Professor McLeod. So that was the point I was trying to make, so apologies for that. If I mis misled anybody on that particular one. Uh, mentioned respite and, and obviously voluntary workers as well, and there's health and social care professionals too. Uh, I just wonder what your thoughts are. I think I may know what they are, but uh, I need to, to, to answer in this particular question. 
Do we think that further investment is needed in specialist nurses with, for people with neurological conditions? Um, I'll just fire that out. I'm sure it'll all be yes, but I'll fire it out anyway. And perhaps if you could say why they would be more needed, we need more investment, and what they bring uh, to people with neurological conditions that others can't. I think we've Sorry. touched on before that there is a generic aspect to many aspects of the nursing care. However, there are also specifics. Um, so I would think this is a kind of two two pronged approach. One would be the generalist aspect that would counter you know come across most a lot of aspects of the training of um, the need. However, as Tanith has already explained, there are some but it doesn't mean that you can't pick up on things. You know, once somebody has gone through the specialist nurse, the, the neuro, and then they come into a situation, we deal with Parkinson's, we deal with MND, we deal with non-invasive ventilation. You know, it's about having the broad spectrum aspect of, of ability as well but there is a need at certain stages throughout the pathway that they will need specialist nursing care mm -hmm. well, well, specialist John sorry I think the simple answer would be yes, <laughs> but um, it's much more complex than that. And I think, you know, we've been describing this morning about people's journey from acute right through to end of life. Um, and at various points, they will need to access specialist advice and support. Um, so whilst it would be great to have more resource, it, that might not necessarily be the best use of resource. Um, I think there are other ways of, you know, supporting people. Um, and the reason I say that is that we've got we've got some um, tests um, at the moment um, across the UK where we're providing lower level services in terms of self management, which are nurse led. Um, they, we've got one. Um, CNS, Community Nurse Specialist, who um, oversees that project. But it is healthcare advisors who are supporting people um, live with their condition and supporting them to manage their condition. Um, so there are other more, there are more cost effective ways of using um, the limited resources we have um, to be able to benefit people. So while specialist nurses are fantastic, and you know, absolutely, I would advocate for them. It, there are, you know, we wouldn't, I wouldn't just want to say that's the only solution to people's problems. My, my first response as a health professional, when asked if we need more resources, of course, is going to be to say yes, but the extent of that is, is important. And, and working out the extent of that will require more data. This is where the NACNC's uh, bid to scope services across the country uh, will be so important. And actually, if we can work out, for instance, uh, how many patients with a new diagnosis of epilepsy don't get to see the nurse, then we get a measure of how many more epilepsy specialist nurses we need. If we can work out how many more people with Parkinson's don't get regular review of the medication with the nurse and don't get help at home with anything else they need from the nurse, then we can answer that question properly. So I'll say yes, but I'll not know how big a yes that is until we get the data. And I think we should be charging the NECNC with, with completing their scope and their services so that I can tell you how big that yes should be. <coughs> Followed by Tana. So I, I, I agree with Pamela's point that it's not just nurses, and there's some of the role which is disease specific, but there's some signposting, what services are, there's some life skills coaching, there's some counselling that goes on, and, and, and different healthcare professionals can have those skills. I'd make a couple of observations. Firstly, across our different diseases, we've got a different caseload, acceptable caseload burden for nurses. So, so a community psychiatric nurse might look after 20 or 30 patients. A motor neuron disease nurse might have 20 or 30 patients on their patch. Same with a Huntington's nurse. For an epilepsy or a Parkinson's disease nurse, they are dealing with hundreds, sometimes a thousand patients. And what's interesting is, is that the the uh, nurses which tend to have fewer patients integrate much better across the primary secondary care divide than ones who are dealing with hundreds of patients with epilepsy, seeing them as a, as a hospital-based epilepsy specialist nurse. So I think there are opportunities if we have increased specialist nurse numbers for better integration with, with, uh, uh, with social care. The second thing is that for, I think actually for most neurology units who have specialist nurses, there's a problem uh, of, uh, of the continuity of the service when a nurse retires or moves on. If you've got a very small number, so we've got two multiple sclerosis nurses, which is good because if and when uh, our senior nurse decides that she's had enough and she's going to go off and retire, then we've got a ready-made replacement to step up, up into her shoes. But in other conditions, we've only got one, and so someone retires and you're having to strain, train someone from scratch again. And so there's not really a 
career structure for neurology specialist nurses. And to my mind, a structure which started off with someone deploying that generic neurology specialist nurse skills and then moving later in career into a specialization in a particular uh, condition would give us a career structure which would allow us to have continuity. Uh, not long after I started in Fourth Valley, our, our epilepsy specialist nurse left and we went eight months before we could appoint another one. And it was very, very difficult for patients and for us. And that's partly because there's such a small number of these individuals uh, that, they're, that they're like gold dust. Um, I think that the Neurological Alliance would say yes, we would be highlighting the role that specialist nurses often have on relieving the burden on consultant colleagues um, by identifying the people that really need to see the consultant rather than, um, rather than not. Um, and we would probably also be highlighting the fact it isn't just about nursing support and I think probably physiotherapy and occupational therapy would be two of the other sort of allied health professionals where people would be looking at using professionals with specific insight into neurological issues rather than general musculoskeletal ones um, and um, general issues because they are so crucial to helping people to attain function and, um, and do well. And I think that that applies across all conditions, not just the degenerative ones. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting. Thank you. Ashton. Thank you, Convener. Um, I was reading through the Sue Ryder's written submission uh, before the committee, and I was quite interested to see that you said you're working with the New Economics Foundation um, to develop an economic model on neurological care and, and hopefully to show the positive impact that, that could have on the public purse. Would you be able to tell us a little bit more about that, please? Fresh off the press, um, it is. Um, I got this data only yesterday. So, yeah, we've been doing a piece of work because what we've not been able to do and what we kind of keep saying is that investment will save. Um, and we haven't, you know... Ha it it's all anecdotal. We haven't been able to kind of demonstrate. So we've been working with the New Economics Foundation and we've, we've taken three case studies. Um, so someone with an acquired brain injury, someone with um, a motor neuron disease and someone with Huntington's disease. Now, these are real people that we know and we've taken their their life to date um, and we've mapped it um, against kind of a reactive um, a pathway and a proactive pathway. And some have had a proactive pathway and some have had a very reactive pathway. Um, I've not analysed this in great detail, but just to give you kind of, um, and I can share this with committee um, um, at, a, you know, at a later date, I'm very happy once we have our report to share that with you, but just to give you sort of the percentages. So for the person with um, acquired brain injury, if they follow, um, um, reactive versus proactive, um, there will be savings to the health economy, economy of 75%. So that's if they go through a proper rehabilitation programme and their condition is improved as opposed to them not getting the right rehab um, or that continued rehab that they need. Um, so, I mean, that's a massive percentage and actually I'm shocked to, to, you know, to see that. Um, moving on to the Huntington's disease, again, it was 45% in terms of cost and um, benefit to the health economy if there is a proper um, pathway followed for the management of people with this con those conditions. Um, and um, you won't be surprised, the same for motor neuron disease at 56%. Um, um, so this, um, there's a lot of detail in, in the back of this in terms of what that, how the costings have they've come out. We have got costings in terms of um, per year, um, and we've um, extrapolated those costs for the for an average lifetime as well. So we will be able to share that with committee um, once we um, have had the time to digest it. As I say, I, I've got this paper sellotape together so that I could demonstrate this for you today. That's, that sounds very interesting, very positive. I'm wondering if the panel are aware of any other um, cost-benefit analysis that are similar to that that might help with you know national planning? Or is that the only one that... Um, we have... Uh, We've done some work with ISD, as I originally stated, that we have been working out, you know, if a guest comes to us, 
uh, at the cost of, you know, to say two thousand pounds for the fortnight, if they had to go into or to, uh, they had to go into hospital, which a lot of our guests have to do if they're non-invasive ventilation, and care homes will not accept that responsibility. We reckon that that would be, you know, obviously high dependency. So it's probably saving about five thousand pounds a week. John Paul. In the case of epilepsy and, and uh, the very refractory epilepsies that may require some medium-term residential care, we've got the Quarriers Scottish Epilepsy Centre in Glasgow, which is absolutely state-of-the-art, world-class epilepsy centre. And we know that although it may be a short-term cost, exactly as Mary's uh, uh, clarified with her uh, clients, uh, when we admit patients to the Scottish Epilepsy Centre, it may have a short-term cost, but there is a definite payoff in reducing uh, need for acute care, emergency admissions, assessments, active emergency, ambulance journeys, all these things are saved and there is a definite net saving. Now, I don't have the figures to hand, uh, but that was a, a, a bit of work done by uh, Jerry De Hagen and, and Maria Otto over in, in Quarriers. Done and the figures yes. are available. Yes. So, uh, so with my professorial rather than neurological hat on, uh, I'm always slightly dubious of uh, data that I get from drugs companies about how good their drugs are. And I, and I think we need to be quite careful that, that we have independent cost utility, cost benefit analysis of these various services because clearly it's in the interest of people providing their services to show how valuable they are. Now, I don't doubt that they have value, but I think if you're making public resource allocation decisions, you want to do that on the basis of the best information that you have. And what we've you know, our running theme through today has been that our starting point information isn't actually very good for how many patients there are, what the demand is, what the impact of these various services might be and therefore what the cost saving might be. Now, of course, we have to proceed on the basis of the best information that we have available. But if you were to read, I hope my employers aren't listening, but if you were to read some of the business cases that I make about how if they give me a little bit of money for this, it will transform the whole of NHS Fourth Valley, you know, you would say that I was taking an optimistic gloss on what might be possible. And I think we just need to be careful about that. Okay, thank you. Alison Johnson. <laughs> Thank you, convener. Um, I, I think it's been a very interesting session. I think um, one thing that's key to delivering the best neurological services, obviously, is the staff that we have in place. And, you know, I certainly experienced that at Lukey House and visiting other facilities across Scotland. And I'd just like to understand, I mean, Malcolm McLeod, you've stated that, that most, if not all, neurology services in Scotland struggle to meet performance targets for both urgent and routine new patient referrals. And you speak about delays for follow-up appointments. So... Uh, you also say there's a problem recruiting to neurology posts. So uh, I would just like to understand how do these delays um, affect the patients and what can we do about solving the recruitment problem? So, so we've got recent experience of this in fourth. When, when I, I was talking to John Paul in the way, and when I were a lad, the idea that there would be a consultant neurology position in Scotland vacant without a single applicant would, would have been uh, incredible. And yet we had a post that we didn't get a single applicant for. And I like to think that we were a reasonable place to work, you know, a nice environment uh, I, I, and all of that. So there are issues about recruitment, for sure. In terms of the harms that might come, I would like to think that on receipt of a referral from a general practitioner, for instance, if it was clear that the patient needed to be seen urgently, we would push the boat out to see them urgently. And often that means phoning them up, saying, could you come up at 8 o'clock and we'll see you before the clinic starts. However... You know, our routine waiting list, uh, sorry, our waiting list for urgent outpatient appointments, we should see people within 10 working days. It's more like three or four weeks. Uh, and the target for seeing uh, routine outpatients is 12 weeks. And for us, it's, it's nearer 18 just now. And I think it's the same in most places. Now, there is a question as to what harm comes to patients while they're on the waiting list. And I'm not sure that there's a great deal of, if you like, biological or medical harm. But there's lots of anxieties associated with waiting for someone to tell you either this isn't something to worry about or that you've got a scan and everything's all right or, 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 or yes, we need to do this. For people who have conditions where their primary care physician has advised them not to drive until they get neurological opinion, you know, warning strokes or epilepsy or, the, or possible epilepsy or the like, then they're not driving for that period until they... And it's one of the most frustrating things when someone sees you after five weeks and you say, actually, you, you never needed to stop driving. You could have... You could, but it takes a while to get there. Now, the issues uh, with recruitment, I think, are multitudinous. Uh, but remember that across the healthcare service, real-term salaries have fallen by about 15 to 20% in these last seven years. 
so it's a less attractive proposition. I know of junior doctors who are leaving to work in uh, finance, to work in consulting, to work in other places because, because they don't see it as being a, a, a career for someone like them. They could earn more doing something that was perhaps almost as enjoyable uh, doing something else. I think we've got particular issues in Scotland relating both to our ability to recruit from overseas now with, with concerns about what, happened, uh, what might happen with Brexit. Uh, I'm not aware of any major differences, uh, although I, I suspect the situation is probably slightly worse in Scotland than it is in England. Uh, nobody really likes to speak about this very much, but I think undoubtedly the, the difference in uh, higher awards, what used to be called merit awards in Scotland compared with England. We were trying to work this out, but I guess that the lifetime prevalence of a higher award for a neurologist in England is about 30 or 40%. So leaving neurology training and looking to where you will choose to have a consultant job, if you elect to work in England, then your chance that by the, by the time you retire, you'll have a higher award is about 30 or 40%. In Scotland, that chance is, is zero. And I think that impacts on our ability to recruit. And I think for uh, a, a, a whole variety of reasons, we need to do everything we can to maximise... I'd like to have five applicants for every job so I could choose the very best. And just now, I'll take anyone who'll apply and make it through to interview. And I don't think that's good for patients with neurological diseases in Scotland. Um, I think the, the, the level of anxiety that people have, I think particularly around if they're presenting neurological symptoms, is very, very high because a lot of these conditions are very serious. Fortunately, most people who present don't have those, but the worry is really profound. What The thing that I also wanted to highlight was that the measures that health boards are taking to deal with the recruitment crisis are sometimes unhelpful. So we're using um, locum neurologists coming in who don't know the local systems means that people are getting a diagnosis and being chucked back into primary care without being referred into the services which do exist to support them if they've got multiple sclerosis or Parkinson's or or whatever. So they are struggling without the information that they need to manage their, their, their um, service or their symptoms well, and they're just not getting the information that they need. So um, that, is a, that is an additional problem as health boards try and respond. There, um, you kind of touched on the, pop, the well, sometimes people are being put back into or put into primary care without uh, appropriate information following them. Is there a is there a possibility that greater multidisciplinary working in primary care could improve support for people with neurological conditions? Yes. Um, well, to, to answer your question, Alison, yes, I, I, would, I would agree with you because, um, you know, as, and also I'll touch on the recruitment aspect, but yes, and also better communication between health and social care. That's really the whole, the knitting of health and social care. Getting more mature and much more efficient will make a huge difference. Um, at Lukey, we are nurse-led and physio-led, so you know I, I can only talk about actual nursing aspects. However, it's no surprise that there's a national shortage of nurses and it's going to get worse, so um, that's not an easy thing to do. But it's also the care assistance side of things because it's a lot easier to work in Little or Tesco for, you know, for not much difference in, in, in salary with a heck of a lot less responsibility. And SSSC have also just um, put on quite a lot of learning and development, which is absolutely fine, but I, we, I think a lot of care providers are now thinking actually it's gone too much the other way because people might want to spend life in care. They don't necessarily want to have an SVQ4 in, uh, in management to be a care assistant. So we need to get a fine balance there because that is putting people off as well because some people embrace it learning and want to do it some people don't but it doesn't mean that they're not a good care assistant you know so we we need to get a fine balance on that um the nurse as far as an uh, rn is concerned we're rural as well which doesn't you know help however there's ways of skinning a cat and you know we've up up 
upgraded uh, our senior care assistants to take on more responsibility so that the, the actual uh, trained staff will do what you know they are trained to do and the, so there's different ways of doing it however that is not a nice thing the other thing is there's a huge um aspect of agency nursing being used now now um agency nurses are being paid really well they can pick and choose what days they want to work and they will earn just as much as they would in a substantive post with very little responsibility and you know it's not just nursing i'm talking about locum vets and uh, pharmacists as well so it this is a culture that's coming in that we've allowed to come in because we're not we're not funding these positions as they should be so it, it's not just in it's not just nurses and doctors we're talking about a whole the, the whole spectrum but the agency aspect and the locum aspect is something that is extremely worrying John Paul. Sorry. For me, just to uh, ask your indulgence, just to uh, go back to Malcolm's point about the data on couriers, that, that, that data about the cost effectiveness is in the public domain and has been peer reviewed. So uh, thanks very much for that, Malcolm. <laughs> thanks for the opportunity be, for me to bring that up again. That's, that's fabulous. Um, I, I think the recruitment issues and workforce issues are important. Of course, at the other end of the, 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 the journey, we have a retention problem uh, and we have a difficulty with disillusioned, overworked, uh, hard-pressed senior members of staff, not just medical, but nursing as well. And unless we do something imaginative and something reasonable to make sure that the working experience is reasonable, we will struggle to retain them beyond their mid-50s. And that's a big issue. I would very much echo Tana's, Tana's point about the use of uh, short-term locums, uh, the use of uh, agencies bringing consultants in for a weekend to see patients at 20-minute intervals, uh, you know, 10, 14, 20 patients a day. This is not a way to deal with a conditions such as epilepsy or Parkinson's <laughs> or MS, which is going to be a lifelong condition, to give them a label and send them packing back to the GP is expensive and it's not useful. If you please, Mark. Yes, so, so uh, I, I, uh, I, I detest the, 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 this bringing in uh, activity from outside. Uh, I, I think it's, it's, it's driven by a, by a desire for boards to meet their waiting time targets, but it's very disruptive. We uh, had had uh, people coming in doing clinics over the weekend, and we audited what happened. And the rate at which they requested investigation was much higher than our in-house neurologists. Uh, the rate of complaints was much higher. The rate of return appointments made was much lower. And the chaos that ensued was much, much, much higher. Uh, and it would have been quicker if I'd seen those 100 patients uh, than it was trying to clear up the mess afterwards. So it's very disruptive. I want to come back to the point that you made about closer working with, with in, in, into primary care. Some years ago, I... Uh, for uh, about a year or so, did neurology clinics in primary care practices around the, the, the Fourth Valley Park, so out in Calendar and Socky and places like that. Uh, and while it was great fun, I don't think there was any great added value for the patient for them being seen by a consultant neurologist in a different environment. So I don't think that diagnostic interaction is something that we need to think about pushing out into the community. But I think the other parts of what we do, particularly around care and specialist nurses, could, could very reasonably be pushed further out into the primary care. Thank you very much. Uh, Ivan McKee. Uh, thank you, convener, and good morning. Uh, panel, thanks for coming along. Been very interesting so far. I want to go back and touch on um, some of the questioning, uh, follow up some of the questioning that Ash Denham was making around about the, the economics of this and the cost benefit analysis. Um, and and it's, I look very much look forward to seeing the work you've got from the New Economics Foundation. And I take Professor McLeod's point on board. Um, I've spent a lifetime not believing, being cynical about um, uh, purported benefits. If you spend some here, you'll get some there. But the reality is, and we've heard that many examples this morning, um, very concrete ones, we just heard one there talking about um, about consultants. If you if you do things better and spend money in the right place, you will make, make a difference. Um, so I suppose I just want to explore that a wee bit further. First one about what mechanisms are in place to allow us to analyse that, and I think the answer is, probably not very much um, and it should be very very ad hoc which is bad but it's also good because it means there's a lot of opportunity there and secondly what um, what changes to structures would have to be made and I think we've touched on this as well with the savings not following the patient what, what changes in the way we, we measure and, and track money and, and, and the, the decision making process is there so the person that's making the decision about the investment is the, the part of the organisation that's also been getting the benefit from the from the saving and is able to, to reinvest so maybe you just want to explore around about those areas and, and, and get, give us your thoughts on ways forward yeah, thanks, John Paul. Uh, 
So, so, so the problem with, with inter-board transfer, so, so, so there, there's probably four boards that have inpatient neurology services uh, and, and the rest avail themselves of those services as and when they need them. And the cost for transfers between boards are, are, I think, reconciled according to something called blue book agreements, which is at the end of you know, three years later, people tally up who moved in which direction, who moved in which direction across all of their services, across the cross-boundary flows, and then work out an overall number and say, well, Lothian owes Forth Valley X or Forth Valley owes Lothian X. And it's, it's almost impossible to unpick. Now, I mean, I've, I've, str I've struggled with this over the years, but the... the one of the great benefits of having a socialised healthcare system is that you don't have to count every penny and every bit to generate a bill at the end of the day that goes to a patient. And that's, that, there's a substantial cost saving in that, which we see in the different cost of administration of healthcare with us compared with the US, for instance. The downside of it is that you don't have access to that information to manage your services adequately. Uh, now, it should not be above the beyond the wit of man for us to be able to avail ourselves of new information technologies and the like to be able to capture things in much finer detail, much finer grain, to know what's happening where, to try and allow those funds then to follow. Um, but my experience of NHS f uh, finance is that it is a big, massive thing that nobody really understands the big picture of and trying to get money to flow from one bit of it to another is incredibly complex. And so either you bite the bullet and say, we're going to understand every penny that flows and what it was spent on, or you're going to say, actually, you guys, we kind of trust you to do just about the right thing, but we'd like you to do a bit more of this, which is, which is how it works or, or doesn't work just now. But, but are there not? I mean, there are specific examples we had from um, you talked about pressure sensors and things like that, and, and that does deliver savings further down the line. Those things are very small, but kind of obvious, and they all add up. And it'll be interesting to see the detail behind the new economics foundation stuff, because that'll be the same. There'll be examples in there. Whereas if you do that, you save that. And at a micro level, are there not a lot of those small dots that can be joined that make things easier to? But the saving never goes into the budget from which the expenditure was made. And so you save a bit of money here by spending a bit of money here. So you end up spending more, and there's no way of matching that, that even if that saving's identifiable. So if I've got a great neurology service, that means that there are 5 or 10% fewer attendances at my emergency department from my patients with epilepsy. That's money that's not spent, but it's not a... There's not, it's not in someone's briefcase that they can deliver to my neurology service so I can employ another epilepsy specialist nurse because it's expenditure foregone. And so that's the difficulty with trying to, uh, trying to uh, attribute savings to allow expenditure, which is, which is what we all would like to be able to do. I mean, we, we took a bit of a stab trying to kind of just demonstrate this because there isn't the data available and there isn't kind of you can't say if you do this you will get that and you know where the resources are allocated is hugely complex so that is the difficulty that in we had this kind of i suppose naive um hope that with health and social care integration that pooled budgets might help some of this um resource allocation but and that might come um, you know, and that could come, and that could be very helpful. Um, but we're, you know, we're a, we're a long way off that. Um, but I think the detail behind these stories will be very interesting reading in terms of some of the interventions that have um, clearly provided cost savings. Um, and I think we we want to be able to demonstrate that, particularly um, to commissioners, so that we can see you could think about things in a different way. But is the government engaged in that at all? No, we've commissioned this piece of work um, ourselves. So you're not aware of them doing anything in that area? I'm not aware of it, no. I might, but unless anybody else can tell me otherwise, no. Okay. Okay. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, Ryan Ripple. Just a very brief supplementary. I mean, I, I, I have a particular interest around the preventative uh, agenda and this, you've alluded to this idea of how do we allocate money that we didn't spend? Uh, sort of idea, and, and I think I would just like to ask the question: uh, Is from your perspective, is there a way in which we should be looking at that 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 sort of preventative agenda? A way in which we should be taking the money that we don't spend 
and allocating it somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, I, so I think when you work out how much money, so I said the savings that you make because someone didn't attend A&E, but, but try and break that down, what that is. So, so there are some opportunity costs of that A&E attendance because someone's had to use a syringe to draw some blood and they've sent it away to the lab. And there's some costs that would be incurred anyway because you've got to be seen by a doctor for half an hour. But if you don't turn up, the doctor's not being, not, not being paid for. They're, they're doing something else. So when we say, oh, these are the costs that are saved, that would be if then we could change the way that a and run so the A&E didn't incur those costs. And I think there's an issue there about the, about the, the linkage between being able to re reduce reduced reliance on, for instance, A&E departments and therefore how well they have to be staffed and, and actually that leading to savings. Be because me reducing the number of people attending A&E with epilepsy isn't going to make A&E's bills go down by very much so those so those those costs aren't going to aren't going to change very much at all so i think trying to get into the into the detail of where those savings are and and what they might be is is really difficult collecting more information might be helpful but i'm not altogether confident of that can i um one of the unique things that when guests come to Lucky, we've got the opportunity to do 24-hour assessment, which is not just five or ten minutes in a GP surgery or a social, you know, a social worker visiting your house. So from that, we're able to ascertain a lot more detail, a lot more information, and liaise back to the community teams. Now, sometimes they don't want to listen to this information because it now means that a guest needs hoisted in the evening. Um, whilst in the morning they can do transfer because they're they're more fit and whatever, and it's going to be double handling as far as the local authority is concerned, which means two people going in at night, not just one person going in at night. So there is a lot of um, aspects of that that you we are struggling to actually get local authorities to understand because if not, our guests tell us they just pull a pillow off the bed and they sleep on the floor because they can't get themselves into bed in the evening. So we can be that advocacy for our, you know, the amount of people that come to look at the 6,500 respite days. We can be that advocacy because we've got 24 hour assessment, but we do have um, struggles also with wheelchair assessments and wheelchair um, roho cushions and various, and even you know pressure mapping or stand aids or all the stuff that we do. There's a resistance to listening to what, we're, what we would like to tell people, you know? Um, just um, picking up your point about um, the preventative agenda, I think I think we're going to have to do some small tests of change, really, in order to um, realise the benefits. Um, I think you know, and we need to be able to demonstrate that. I think we mentioned earlier on the panel about small pockets of money becoming available um, to do innovative things. So, for instance, the self-management fund that we um, self-management. Um, program that we are doing for three years um, out of our um, DVU service. It's short, um, it's short funded. We've got three years funding. We're doing a full evaluation of that service so that we can demonstrate benefit in terms of outcomes for people and also outcome, um, you know, um, financial benefits as well. But we need to get people to be receptive to what we're trying to demonstrate. And therein lies the problem, is that you can demonstrate this, but once the money is gone, the money is gone. Um, and you know, we, unless it goes into a commissioning strategy um, where people are saying, actually, that looks like a really good holistic pathway and we're going to invest some money at that level, um, nothing will change. Thank you very much. Final lady of questioning, uh, David Stewart. Uh, thank you, convener. Can I again also thank the panel for their excellent evidence to date? We've touched on carers briefly in the evidence so far, but can I ask very specifically about carers? What assessment have the panel made of the new Carers Act 2016, which actually comes into force on Easter Sunday? I don't think there's any religious significance um, about that. Um, but could ask specifically, how is that going to help people with neurological conditions? We welcomed it. We were part of the consultation process. We really, um, we look after carers. We try to look after carers just as much as we look after our guests. We call it our Keep Well, Keep Caring campaign. Um, and the standards are, are very good. But again, there is not so much evidence that I see just now. I, I'm not quite sure, but there is not the evidence that I see of the resource behind it. And I, again, for local authorities, it's, it's another aspect to adapt, and I think that must be quite a, a, a strain for some of the local authority budgets. I absolutely ag ag agree with that. Uh, 
my assessment of people who care for people with neurological conditions is that support for those carers is quite neglected and I think in some cases it's about insidious need that develops over over a very gradual period for people which means that you don't get a tipping point to identify when care is needed so one of the key things in the carers act is going to be having proper carers identification strategies however that needs to be properly resourced so that once you've identified that somebody has caring caring needs and need support that that support can be provided and it has to be said that i would be concerned that there isn't enough resource in the actual implementation of the act itself but also in the wider community resources which are essential to providing that support because we know that um carers projects and things like that are amongst the areas that are at risk of having their funding cut by um local authorities that are strapped for cash and obviously yeah my needs have been identified and yet there is no support to meet those needs i think that's a very real risk as we as we move forward so the intention is great we just need to see it realized important aspect that i certainly support in the new act is is the young carer statement which identifies their needs and how that needs are going to be funded and I think that amplifies your earlier point how important is is that um i think um young carers are playing a massive role in supporting people with lots and lots of neurological um, neurological conditions across the board because clearly you know a, there are a number of conditions that affect people of childbearing and child rearing age and clearly um, those those children are under a great deal mm -hmm. of stress currently but I would also make the argument that in general, neurological services are less good at providing that family and holistic support than some other areas of the health service. I'd, I'd say that oncology is probably much better at identifying those family needs, picking those up and moving forward. And perhaps um, neurological services have been a little bit more atomized and focused on acute need historically and diagnosis and maybe haven't been able to provide that family support. So... There's real opportunity here for carers of all ages, I think, to be to have their lives improved as long as the Carers Act is properly resourced. I mean, we're, we're delivering um, to over 500 people in the community around Scotland, and one of the things that we have been seeing is the struggle that you know young carers and also um, people of all ages, really older carers as well, it is a huge issue. And in fact, in the last year, we've had to actually flag up safeguarding issues um, for particularly young, vulnerable adults who are supporting. Um, um, and we've never really had to do that before, but we've felt there's been significant risk to that young person. Um, so I, you know, welcome, um, you know, welcome it. But as everyone else has said, the resourcing of it is what's going to make it happen. And in the past, when we were um, funded by the MS Society, we had a fortnight every year where families could come, uh, the person with MS, their partner and the children, and the partner could well be living in a nursing home just now, you know, already, and they never had the opportunity to have a family holiday and to actually, and to see how these young children interacted together and how they worked together and how they supported each other and still are, even though they, they don't visit us anymore. But it really highlighted as you worked with them each year, the problems that arose, there was a different problem from when they were under 10 to when they were 14, 16, 17. And I think that tracking is something that's also not happening. You know, it, just because they're 16 doesn't mean that they're not actually having more issues, actually, as they're growing older. Yes, so just very briefly, I, th I think the key, a key part of this is, to, is telling this point that, people, that carers f function really very well for a while but but then gradually things get worse and worse and worse and often you get to the stage where people have to go away for the weekend to induce a crisis to to get the professional care, care uh, services involved and i think if if there was one thing that you could fix it would be anticipatory support for individuals and for their carers so that things were put in place immediately before they were needed not two weeks after they were needed and that would make a huge difference to the lives of people with neurological conditions Convener, another important aspect of the bill, uh, or the Act, I should say, is to involve carers in the discharge uh, from hospital care. H what do the panel feel about that aspect of the Act? 
Well, it doesn't always happen now, so it's got to be a, a real, a real move forward to get away from being discharged from acute hospital in the middle of the night to arrive back at home to their. Care. Well, how did this happen? Yeah. Um, so I think that's that. That is a real strength as long as it properly happens, because at the end of the day, if people need out of a bed. They're going to be hoiked out of a bed, almost regardless of what the CARES Act says. So uh, perhaps my acute um, medical colleagues could give a perspective on how likely that is. To... So, so the reason that patients are discharged at three o'clock in the morning is because there's an emergency at the front door that needs a bed and the hospital doesn't have enough beds. That's the reason it happens. And so the solution is pretty straightforward. I think that's a formalisation of what we would consider best practice, which is that the, care, the, the carers and the family are involved. But I think for the reasons highlighted, it doesn't always happen. Yeah. Thank you very much. And can I thank our witnesses for a very uh, full and informative session? Uh, much appreciated. And we will uh, follow up uh, on that uh, in due course. Thank you very much. We will now take a break until 11.45 when we will go into private session.